Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kotaro Watanabe from Tokyo. I'm a design engineer. And uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, talk about future of innovation um, through prototyping and story weaving today. Um, before getting, uh, getting into the details, I'd like to explain a little bit about uh, my firm, Takram, Takram Design Engineering. And as the name suggests, um, we deal with um, integration of design and engineering at a, at a higher level. What we uh, do, we try to, um, well, we, we do quite a lot of things, including uh, product development, concept development, space design, branding, uh, et cetera, et cetera, workshop and lectures, things like that. We wouldn't want to define or limit what we do by our uh, output. Rather, we'd like to define ourselves by our attitude, which is to uh, shift our modes of thinking from one uh, to the other. Uh, for example, in this case, design and engineering. And there can be many um, variations of this, of course. But uh, today, I'd like to em uh, put an emphasis on this point uh, of amplitude motion between two modes. Um, one example being design and engineering. But before getting into the details, let me briefly, uh, very bri uh, briefly explain about what kind of things we've been making past five years. We were founded in 2006. I'd like to know uh, how many of you here uh, know Sabran Muji, please. Ah, great. Uh, probably a little bit less than 90%. How many uh, of you here uh, is aware of Takram, please? Uh, less than 90%. <laughs> Anyhow, um, we, we've done this iOS uh, application. Um, we've been uh, quite active in the field of user interface design, uh, mobile phone applications, user interface design, uh, interactive installations in museums and showrooms. Otherwise, uh, another uh, installation that took place in Milan that's uh, something interactive, a little bit more about the product design. We do a little bit of robots as well. Um, something a little more poetic. All these things. And after you know, showing this, people often get quite confused what we do exactly. And I, I do understand uh, how people feel. But the thing is, uh, just like I said earlier, uh, we wouldn't want to define our limitations by our outputs. Uh, medium uh, is... Well, I mean, we make things. Uh, uh, the thing is, um, what we'd like to define ourselves by is the attitudes that we think and create, which is about the um, amplitude motion between design and engineering. And it's uh, quite easier to understand if you put it this way. Uh, on the y-axis, put design and engineering. On the x, software, hardware you find four regions. And many uh, companies or groups of creators tend to focus on one region, but then we, we somehow find more excitement and joy in the overlapping field or, uh, around the borders, you see. Uh, so how to integrate different uh, regions. That's our theme, in a way. I'd like to put an emphasis on three points today. First one being prototyping, the physical aspect, and the second one, um, story weaving, which is about conceptual prototyping, and the third is the interaction between them, interaction between physical and conceptual or um, prototyping and story weaving. And when I say amplitude motion between two modes, it could be any two modes. Obvious example is design and engineering, it could be about physical and conceptual, right side of your brain and left side, probably creativity and logic, um, prototyping and story weaving, of course. And oftentimes, uh, answers emerge in the after image in the transition. It's not on one side, but in the middle, probably, in motion. So what we find, uh, uh, we often find solutions and answers in, uh, uh, that emerges in the after image. Uh, in the pendulum mo motion, right? Our answers are found in forms of context, rather. And uh, in order to ex uh, Nanda, explain to you a little bit about what we do in terms of integration of design and engineering, I'd like to show you one example. This is 
one of our latest works uh, exhibited in uh, Detroit Motor Show, Toyota presented a new concept car based on Prius, envisioning a uh, five years future. The concept car uh, is called NS4. And this is a small video. And I believe through this, people can understand more or less what we do. And while I distract you guys by the video, I'd like to take a photo of you. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, in, in, in the... We didn't touch uh, anything exterior. We only dealt with the car navigation system. But in, in for entertainment system, that uh, consists of two displays, basically. One, just uh, behind the front shield, a wide display showing uh, only widgets of what you uh, usually see in, in a car. And the seven-inch display closer at hand, which functions as a remote. Uh, it's not very clear up here, but what's happening is the driver is controlling this seven-inch display. It's a touch panel display where you can control, download, and upload, communicate between two uh, screens. That's what's happening. And uh, we didn't uh, only design the interaction of this. We also dealt with the uh, hardware engineering, software engineering, you know, programming and uh, electricity circuit and everything like that in-house. So that's our um, competence, basically. We try to uh, integrate design, engineering, hardware, and software by ourselves in, in, a, in a higher level. So that's... Uh, basic, uh, that's a very simple glimpse of what we do in business. Integration of user interface, design, UI engineering, electronics of both hardware and software. And in terms of the amplitude motion, obviously this is a back and forth, swinging motion between design and engineering. But at the same time, or in the after image rather, between these two modes you see a certain aspect of experience you can never get. Uh, focusing on one side. Another example I'd like to show. This is a rather conceptual version of what we, conceptual um, kind of thing that we do. We were um, invited to take part in an art exhibition called Documenta. It takes place every five years in Germany. It's a uh, quint Quintennial International Contemporary Art Exhibition that takes place in Kassel. And we were given this um, setting or background that in, in, in uh, well, basically we were asked to design something for a hundred years time. And uh, the organizers were envisioning post-apocalypse uh, thick world, world with hazardous materials everywhere, radioactive emissions everywhere. And we were asked to design in, in such a setting a water bottle in 100 years' time, a water bottle. Rather than designing a conventional bottle, we started to brainstorm around what we can do around uh, water. Initial ideas included uh, maybe we can do something like bioengineering, uh, store water within a vegetable, or other strange ideas. Catalog of trepidation. But then we asked ourselves after a while, what is a bottle of completely different paradigm? What we can do to uh, get ri uh, rid of our restrictions in our mind and design something completely new? And we, after much consideration, we uh, re reached this idea of rather than designing a conventional bottle, we decided to uh, convert a human body into a water bottle-like system. You see, um, these are actually a series of artificial organs to be implanted within human bodies that converts um, your body into a water bottle-like, water-recycling, self-sustaining system. Well, human body is like that from the beginning, but then more, uh, much more efficient. So all these will be uh, implanted within your body. 
just to reduce the amount of water loss that goes out of your body every day. Uh, just to give you a better, clearer idea, I'd like to show you another video. Your sound. See, um, human body requires 2.5 liters of water every day. We uh, intake from drinking and also eating food. And we lose water uh, through four different routes, which are um, feces, urine, perspiration, and uh, moisture out of breathing. And what we did, uh, we designed a series of artificial organs to be implanted near these regions in your body to reduce water loss uh, as much as possible so that we don't have to drink as much water uh, on, the, on the first hand. So that's the basic idea. This one is to be implanted behind your cheeks in the nasal cavity that basically condense all the moist air out of your lung and uh, let it uh, be captured within the cavities. And all the air you exhale from your nose, uh, it's, it's going to be completely dry and all the moisture is kept within your body. This one is to lower your body temperature by converting the heat energy into electricity. And the neck collar uh, functions as a radiator to emit heat. So that's basically uh, what we designed, you see. Uh, these go into uh, behind your nasal cavities. This one uh, is to be put in the veins in your neck. The radiator behind your neck. These are eggs, candies that uh, five of uh, these will be sufficient for a human body basically to survive in terms of water and food. It uh, includes 165 milliliters of water, uh, different kinds of amino acids necessary for uh, maintaining health, and also uh, a certain substance to keep the pH level of uh, your body, you see. And Please don't get me wrong, I'm not a mad scientist or anything. This was just a conceptual exploration based on science and uh, engineering. But we carried all this to Germany. I, I believe you can imagine the custom nightmare in airport, but... Uh, <laughs> so uh, here, uh, I think somehow you can observe the process, uh, what we dealt with in, in the amplitude motion between prototyping and story weaving. In other words, this is purely our self-funded exploration out of usual client work. And I think we have to do both, basically. Any business that you do, uh, people need to somehow uh, focus on both two aspects of, I don't know, creation, if you're working in a creative industry, in order to somehow envision future. So what emerges among the two is the future vision in our case, in this. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do in workshops and lectures. Um, from, uh, since two or three years ago, we've been very active in the field of training, training for cre creative industries and businesses. You see, we've been doing quite a lot of creations in different genres, but then, uh, you know, we gained a lot of uh, knowledge and methodologies, invented them ourselves, and decided, okay, why not share this? with the entire industry, so the, the entire industry will be more flexible. So that's what we've been doing uh, recently, various kinds of lectures and workshops, mainly with um, universities and uh, high-tech companies. And the theme is on story weaving. Story weaving, by story, I, I don't really mean uh, once upon a time there was a princess kind of story. Here, I, I, what I mean is by story is the ultimate philosophy for running a project for uh, a group of people if there is a, a shared concept. 
what is story weaving? It is about prototyping a concept, just like you prototype a physical um, object, just like uh, you, uh, you uh, play with clay, you can play with concepts as well. Because uh, what's important is that, uh, what's important is to create while story weaving and to weave a story while creating. One shouldn't come before the other. It should be a mutual, interactive, cyclic activity. You see? Uh, so uh, this is what I call a story weaving curves. Prototyping a story weaving. In other words, um, physical aspect and conceptual aspect should take place simultaneously and interactively, not one behind, uh, before the other. And the result would be product and story side by side in a very strong uh, combination. Uh, to weave, basically, you have to have both uh, warp and woof, the vertical and horizontal. Here, uh, this, by this I mean the conceptual and physical simultaneously. And by uh, being able to share a story, you can make all listeners storytellers. If you're working in a project, working in a company, even if you're an independent person, you have to work a lot with external people. You need to make everyone a storyteller. So that's what we do. And uh, I run a lot of trainings for companies, but this is one example that I've been doing since two or three years ago. It's a workshop for in-house designers and engineers of Japanese companies such as Toyota, Honda, Sony, Panasonic, etc. We gather 20 or 30 uh, designers and engineers from different industries. Let them form a group of three beyond uh, affiliations, basically. So a car designer of Toyota and a camera designer of Sony could end up in the same group and uh, start collaborating. That's basically what we do in our workshop. And uh, we let each group ideate, prototype, and make a final product. Let them film. Uh, uh, photo shoot the final product, and we uh, publish a booklet book based on a series of uh, results that was yielded uh, through, through the workshop. Um, for example, this is a collaboration uh, among a designer from Panasonic, Ricoh, and Kokuyo, if I remember correctly. As you can see, there are two umbrellas, plastic umbrellas, seemingly ordinary, but then when there is an overlapping region, there emerges a rainbow out of the, the overlapping region. So each product has a very unique and uh, profound story behind it, but today I'm not uh, getting into the details. Instead, I'd like to play a little interactive game with you. Uh, one of the methodologies or activities that uh, we do in the workshop. Um, oh, uh, by the way, this is a book uh, I published uh, two years ago. Please, if you log on to Amazon, the Japanese version, you can click on buy now and you can buy now. <laughs> well, we explore around a lot of different methodologies and uh, techniques in order to uh, basically form ideas and uh, converge and uh, things like that. Today, I'm, I'd like to share with you tangent sculpture, one technique that you can utilize in order to expand uh, your mind before actually making a concept. This is something you do when you only have a keyword before actually making a concept, okay? Uh, to, to explain in a very simple way, it's an art of narrative without saying. In simpler words, it's, try, uh, it's uh, an attempt to try to explain something without saying its name, you see. There is a, a result of tangent sculpture, so what I'd like to do with you all today is to do a little game instead of actually writing the description so you can have a, a, a good understanding of this. I have a slight um, anxiety if people uh, in the back can, can read what's on the screen. The character's a little bit small, but uh, would you all mind standing up, everyone? What I'd like to do is to show you, what I'd like to do is to show you uh, an explanation of an object. I'm going to explain about an object. When you know what it is, 
Don't say it aloud. Don't let your neighbors know. Just meaningfully smile and sit, right? <laughs> so that your, your neighbors wouldn't know the answer. It's a quiz. It's a quiz. You see, I'm going to explain about an object. So, it is often a, a cylindrical thing that has a bottom, but not a top. It's a hollow vessel when standing upright. It's got a limited closed space towards the center of gravity. It's capable of maintaining fixed amount of liquid within Earth's gravitational field without dispersing them. When its interior is filled with air, we call it empty. But even in that situation, its silhouette is elucidated by light, and its quality and quantities can be understood in a quick glance without instruments. No one yet? When snapped by our fingers, it vibrates and emits to become a source of sound. It is at times used as a signal, and rarely, uh, rarely as a module in music, but its uh, reverberation surprises our ears that it manifests a level of self-satisfaction that transcends function. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's nothing difficult. If you think you know the answer, uh, probably you're right. <laughs> It can be placed on top of a, a dinner table, yet again, it can be grasped by a human hand, and it often slips out of a grasp. Oh, quite a lot of people sat down around there, some people in the front, some people in the middle as well, but people seem to be lost. Let me ask someone who is still troubled if, if, if you've got any idea. <laughs> oh, everyone's escaping. Okay, let me just go on. Uh, the answer is glass. The answer is glass. Thank you very much, everyone. Please take a seat. Uh, the answer is glass. So what, uh, what's going on here? Uh, we asked all the designers and engineers to basically take part in, the, in an attempt of trying to describe a glass uh, uh, in, in, in as many different ways as possible. That's the idea. Rather than saying you know, just the word, glass, by trying to approach the idea of glass from different aspects, different angles, you can have a better understanding of what it is about. You see, this is not just a poetry. It's a very uh, design thinking-wise, interesting way of approaching things. For example, the first paragraph refers to a formative aspect. And the second one, a physical, it's not uh, mutually uh, exclusive, but please uh, forgive. Scientific observational aspect there. You see, uh, maintaining fixed amount of liquid. Snap by fingers, it vibrates and emits uh, sound. Used as a signal, meaning, you know, when you have a knife and you want to give a speech, you hit the wine. That's the uh, anthropological aspect. When it comes to the music, uh, probably it's something about John Cage or something. And uh, the final paragraph, uh, dinner table, it often slips out of your finger. It's about uh, cultural and ethnographical aspect of glass, you could say. Uh, I hope you're, you guys are not bored or offended or by this activity, but what I'd like to do with you is to do just one more. Please, everyone, uh, rise again. Just one more, just one more. <laughs> Another one. I, I think by now you kind of get the idea. Please don't say the answer aloud. The uh, attempt is uh, somehow trying to intimidate your neighbors by quietly sitting down, okay? <laughs> So, uh, the different thing. Uh, within our daily lives, this thing can be bifurcated into two main categories, ones that revolve and others that move in parallel. It stands symbolically for the beginning of something new. At times, it's capable of expressing the dawn of the new world or the loss of opportunity, depending on the situation. What is it? I, I believe you've touched it today. Everyone here must have touched it today. This thing can connect a place to another and simultaneously separate them. It can be handled easily and should be able to provide uh, immutable usability to anybody no matter what his or her cultural background. On the other hand, however, there exist few people who have made it their job to actually work with it. Hmm, some people have sat down already. This object exists in different incarnations when it belongs to humans and for cats. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's so funny when people sit here for me. People are able to observe scenes on the other side by peer, uh, peering inside. Also, some messages may incidentally stream at the bottom. What is it? What is it? I, I'd like to uh, ask someone. 
uh, if you've got any idea. No? Not yet. Not yet? Uh, I'd like to ask someone who has already sat down if you happen to know the answer. Yeah. Uh, is it an eye? It's not, uh, I'm afraid it's not an eye. <laughs> the answer actually is a door. a door. Thank you, everyone. Please uh, take <laughs> seats. It's a door. You see? Uh, bifurcated into two main categories, one that revolve and uh, move in parallel. You see? Uh, uh, ordinary door can be a re revolving door if it's got a hinge. It stands symbolically for the beginning of something new, open door, closed door, symbolical meanings there. Um, this thing can connect a place to another. It can be handled easily. Uh, there, there are people, professional people who handle doors, right? Uh, doormen, doormen. That's what's been explained here, right? Uh, exists in different incarnations with a human for cats. You see, uh, there is a door within a door, a small hinge. Intended for cats, I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, a peephole in the middle. And if you are James Bond, you often receive a job assignment from underneath the door. <laughs> so that's what's been meant here. So this uh, activity, tangent sculpture, it's not uh, really meant to be a, a quiz. This is only a result. You see, designers and engineers, uh, we are not very good at controlling words and literature, but by this we try to somehow expand our imaginations. It's, to, uh, it's a way to understand the essentials of, the, of an object, consciously verbalize and define what seems to be even self-evident and ordinary by articulating the unspoken and tacit. Uh, it's about sculpture by tangent lines, uh, tangent lines, by which I mean it's very easy to say an object is a glass. It's very easy to say an object is a door. It's almost like uh, drawing a tangent line, you see? Y equal fx, it's a very uh, simple way to explain an object, a glass, a door. But rather than that, by uh, drawing as many tangent lines as possible, as close to each other as possible, you can somehow sculpt an, a similar idea that resembles very much a door or, or a glass, but then with much more context and much more story behind it in order to share among a group of people what you believe in. And before actually starting, start, uh, starting to design or engineer an object, you have to share with your neighbors and uh, colleagues what's in each other's mind. So basically that's what's, uh, what we are trying to do here. You see, so this attempt is about prototyping a story viewing, the amplitude motion. It's also an attempt to do both theory and practice. In our case, in the midst of these two, we see the uh, chance of innovation. This, uh, that activity is meant to be on, uh, in the very earlier phase of the project rather than making a very strong story or concept, but anyhow. As you can see, we work on, in the different fields of design, engineering, software, hardware, points we touched up on today, the uh, first one being prototyping, the second story weaving, and the third, interaction between the both. Innovation often occurs uh, in the midst of two different modes. Answers emerge in the after image in the transition. That's it, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Darrow for a very uh, thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Now we have time for a couple of questions. So uh, does somebody have a question for Katero? This gentleman back there. I just have a quick question about the tangent sculpture. Yes. Because uh, how, how did that actually help in the design process? Could you give like a real life example of maybe saying something different about a glass or mm -hmm. a door actually help in creating something that is different? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Basically, uh, if you work in a group or a larger enterprise or whatever, uh, people basically have different minds and slightly different purposes even if you're designing a single product. For example, you know, different mindsets for people in different departments. People in the design department, engineering department, someone is from the marketing. And everyone, even though they are making the same product, they slightly have different uh, will and purposes somehow. 
And before actually you know, designing things, it's very essential to somehow export all your thoughts, uh, to uh, spell out, to somehow get everything out of your mind, because we tend to, uh, we tend to believe that people around you believe in the same thing, but we, really, we, we don't. There isn't such a thing as mutual understanding in a perfect sense. And uh, what's very important is to see the wide var uh, variety of our imaginations. For example, if you're in a company and trying to design something like an iPad application, innovative iPad application in the touch panel era or something, no one really knows uh, what a touch panel era really means. And designers and engineers regard this thing as probably a completely different thing. So the idea is uh, to somehow um, spell out everything you have in your mind beforehand, uh, before actually uh, the misunderstanding uh, is amplified in, uh, later in the project. This is meant to uh, take place in the very earlier phase of the project, before actually making a strong concept or story, if I've answered you correctly. Thank you. Uh, another question? Well, I have one. Uh, I'm always trying to get my students to, to weave stories and tell stories. Right. And uh, I find that that's one thing they really struggle with. You mm -hmm. know, they can make models, they can draw, they can do a lot of great things. Uh, do you have any ideas for them on how they can develop their ability to story weave and story tell? Are right. there things they can do to, to enhance that uh, mm -hmm. talent? Well, I, I, when interacting with students, I find that a lot of students tend to put all their concept within their product or their idea. And on the other hand, what I believe or affirm does is to separate your story into two aspects, one being the trunk of the story and the other being branches, uh, as in a tree. You see, uh, you shouldn't put a lot of things in an idea. You should um, eliminate all the details and just stick to the, the most important aspect, which should be the trunk of the story. And all the branches, everyone else can contribute to in, in their own manners. And that's when a story is shared among people. You can somehow uh, resonate to someone else's story because you can grow upon your trunk, uh, your own branches. So a story is not a one-way communication. It's rather a mutual uh, building. It's, it's something that's formed among a, a communication through a communication, I would say. So for students, I would recommend to eliminate the detail, as, may, as much details as possible, and only uh, limit your idea on the trunk. Leave the branches to be built by other um, listeners, if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, can we have a round of applause for Katero? Thank you very much. Thank you.